Islam is the second largest religion in India, with 14.2% of the country's population or roughly 172 million people identifying as adherents of Islam 2011 census as an ethnoreligious group. Islam first came to the western coast of India when Arab traders as early as the 7th century CE came to coastal Malabar and Konkan Gujarat. Cheraman Juma Mosque in Kerala is thought to be the first mosque in India, built in 629 CE by Malik Dinar. Following an expedition by the governor of Bahrain to Baruch in the 7th century CE, immigrant Arab and Persian trading communities from South Arabia and the Persian Gulf began settling in coastal Gujarat. Ismaili Shia Islam was introduced to Gujarat in the second half of the 11th century, when Fatimid Imam al Mustansir Billah sent missionaries to Gujarat in 467 AH, 1073 CE. Islam arrived in North India in the 12th century via the Turkic invasions and has since become a part of India's religious and cultural heritage. Over the centuries, there has been significant integration of Hindu and Muslim cultures across India and Muslims have played a notable role in economics, politics and culture of India. <laughs> Early history of Islam in India Trade relations have existed between Arabia and the Indian subcontinent since ancient times. Even in the pre-Islamic era, Arab traders used to visit the Konkan Gujarat coast and Malabar region, which linked them with the ports of Southeast Asia. Newly Islamist Arabs were Islam's first contact with India. Historians Eliot and Dowson say in their book The History of India, as told by its own historians, that the first ship bearing Muslim travellers was seen on the Indian coast as early as 630 CE. H. G. Rawlinson in his book Ancient and Medieval History of India claims that the first Arab Muslims settled on the Indian coast in the last part of the 7th century CE. Zainuddin Makhdoom II, Tuhafat al Mujahideen, is also a reliable work. This fact is corroborated by J. Storick in his Madras District Manuals and by Haridas Bhattacharya in Cultural Heritage of India, Vol. IV. It was with the advent of Islam that the Arabs became a prominent cultural force in the world. Arab merchants and traders became the carriers of the new religion and they propagated it wherever they went. The first Indian mosque, Cheraman Juma Mosque, is thought to have been built in 629 CE by Malik Dinar although some historians say the first mosque was in Gujarat, in Malabar, the Mapillas may have been the first community to convert to Islam. Intensive missionary activities were carried out along the coast and many other natives embraced Islam. In the 8th century, the province of Sindh in present-day Pakistan was conquered by an Arab army led by Muhammad bin Qasim. Sindh became the easternmost province of the Umayyad Caliphate. In the first half of the 10th century, Mahmud of Ghazni added the Punjab to the Ghaznavid Empire and conducted 17 raids on modern-day India. In the 11th century, Ghazi Syed Salar Masood played a significant role in the conversion of locals Hindus to Islam. A more successful invasion came at the end of the 12th century from Muhammad of Ghor. This eventually led to the formation of the Delhi Sultanate. According to legend, two travellers from India, Mulai Abdullah formerly known as Balam Nath and Maulai Nuruddin Rupnath, went to the court of Imam Mustansir 427-487 AH, 1036-1094 CE and were so impressed that they converted to Islam and came back to preach in India in 467 AH, 1073 CE. Mulai Ahmed was their companion. Abdullah was the first Wali al Hind saint of India. He came across a married couple named Kaka Akila and Kaki Akila who became his first converts in the Tayyabi Bora community. <inaudible> <inaudible> Arab-Indian interactions There is much historical evidence to show that Arabs and Muslims interacted with Indians from the very early days of Islam or even before the arrival of Islam in Arab regions. Arab traders transmitted the numeral system developed by Indians to the Middle East and Europe. Many Sanskrit books were translated into Arabic as early as the 8th century. George Salabane his book, Islamic Science and the Making of the European Renaissance, writes that, 
Some major Sanskrit texts began to be translated during the reign of the second Abbasid caliph Al-Mansur (754–775), if not before. Some texts on logic even before that, and it has been generally accepted that the Persian and Sanskrit texts, few as they were, were indeed the first to be translated. Commercial intercourse between Arabia and India had gone on from time immemorial, with for example the sale of dates and aromatic herbs by Arabs traders who came to Indian shores every spring with the advent of the monsoon breeze. People living on the western coast of India were as familiar with the annual coming of Arab traders as they were with the flocks of monsoon birds, they were as ancient a phenomenon as the monsoon itself. However, whereas monsoon birds flew back to Africa after a sojourn of few months, not all traders returned to their homes in the desert. Many married Indian women and settled in India. The advent of Muhammad (569 to 632 CE) changed the idolatrous and easy-going Arabs into a nation unified by faith and fired with zeal to spread the gospel of Islam. The merchant seamen who brought dates year after year now brought a new faith with them. The new faith was well received by South India. Muslims were allowed to build mosques, intermarry with Indian women, and very soon an Indian Arabian community came into being. Early in the 9th century, Muslim missionaries gained a notable convert in the person of the King of Malabar. The peaceful spread of Islam was suddenly checked when Muslim armies began to invade India. Muhammad bin Qasim 672 CE at the age of 17 was the first Muslim invader and he managed to reach Sindh. Centuries later Mahmud of Ghazni CE was the second, much more ferocious invader, who swept up into northern India as far as Gujarat. <laughs> <laughs> Political history of Islam in India For further details see, History of India Delhi Sultanate Topic Bengal Sultanate Topic Gujarat Sultanate Topic Deccan Sultanates The first independent sultanate in the central Indian region of the Deccan was the Bahmani Sultanate. Later this broke up into a number of different kingdoms collectively known as the Deccan Sultanates. These were five dynasties of various ethnic backgrounds Afghan, Turk, Mongol etc. that ruled late medieval kingdoms, namely, Bijapur, Golconda, Ahmadnagar, Bidar, and Berar in southwestern India. The Deccan Sultanates were located on the Deccan Plateau, between the Krishna River and the Vindhya Range. These kingdoms became independent during the breakup of the Bahmani Sultanate. In 1490, Ahmadnagar declared independence, followed by Bijapur and Berar in the same year. Golconda became independent in 1518 and Bidar in 1528. In 1510, Bijapur repulsed an invasion by the Portuguese against the city of Goa, but lost it later that year. Although generally rivals, they allied against the Vijayanagara Empire in 1565, permanently weakening Vijayanagar in the Battle of Talakota. In 1574, after a coup in Berar, Ahmadnagar invaded and conquered it. In 1619, Bidar was annexed by Bijapur. The Sultanates were later conquered by the Mughal Empire. Berar was stripped from Ahmadnagar in 1596. Ahmadnagar was completely taken between 1616 and 1636, and Golconda and Bijapur conquered by Aurangzeb's 1686 to 87 campaign. Main articles: Ahmadnagar Sultanate, Bidar Sultanate, Berar Sultanate, Bijapur Sultanate, Golconda Sultanate. Topic. Mughal Empire Topic <inaudible> Sir Empire Topic <inaudible> <inaudible> Post Mughal Era For the decline of Muslim politics in India see Maratha Empire East India Company Role in the Indian independence movement 
The contribution of Muslim revolutionaries, poets and writers is documented in the history of India's struggle for independence. Taitumir raised a revolt against the British Raj. Abul Kalam Azad, Hakim Ajmal Khan and Rafi Ahmed Kidwai are other Muslims who engaged in this endeavour. Ashfaqullah Khan of Shahjananpur conspired to loot the British treasury at Kokori Lucknow. Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan popularly known as Frontier Gandhi was a noted nationalist who spent 45 of his 95 years of life in jail. Barakatullah of Bhopal was one of the founders of the Ghadar Party, which created a network of anti British organizations. Syed Ramit Shah of the Ghadar Party worked as an underground revolutionary in France and was hanged for his part in the unsuccessful Ghadar mutiny in 1915. Ali Ahmad Siddiqui of Faizabad planned the Indian mutiny in Malaya and Burma, along with Syed Moitaba Hussain of Janpur, and was hanged in 1917. Vakum Abdul Qadir of Kerala participated in the Quit India struggle in 1942 and was hanged. Umar Subhani, an industrialist and millionaire from Bombay, provided Mahatma Gandhi with Congress expenses and ultimately died for the cause of independence. Among Muslim women, Hazrat Mahal, Asghari Begum, and Bai Amma contributed in the struggle for independence from the British. The first ever Indian rebellion against the British was the Velour Mutiny of 10 July 1806, in which around 200 British officers and troops were killed or injured. The rebellion was subdued by the British, however, and the mutineers and the family of Tipu Sultan who were incarcerated in the Velour Fort at that time had to pay a heavy price. This rebellion predates the Sepoy Mutiny of 1857, as a result of which mostly upper-class Muslim rebels were targeted by the British, as it was under their leadership that the war was fought, mostly in and around Delhi. Thousands of their relatives were shot or hanged near the gate of the Red Fort in Delhi, which is now known as Kuni Durvaza, the Bloody Gate. The renowned Urdu poet Mirza Ghalib (1797–1869) gave a vivid description of such executions in his letters, now published by the Oxford University Press. Ghalib, Life and Letters, compiled and translated by Ralph Russell and Krishidul Islam (1994). As Muslim power waned with the gradual demise of the Mughal Empire, the Muslims of India faced a new challenge, that of protecting their own culture and interests, yet interacting with an alien, technologically advantaged power. During this period, the ulama of Farangi Mahal, based first at Sahali in district Barabanki and, since the 1690s, based in Lucknow, educated and guided the Muslims. The Farangi Mahal led and steered the Muslims of India. Other famous Muslims who fought for independence against British rule were Abul Kalam Azad, Mahmud al Hassan of Darul Uloom Dioban, who was implicated in the famous Silk Letter movement to overthrow the British through an armed struggle, Hussain Ahmad Madani, former Shaykhul Hadith of Darul Uloom Dioband, Ubaidullah Sindhi, Hakim Ajmal Khan, Hazrat Mohani, Syed Mahmud, Professor Malavi Barkatullah, Zakir Hussain, Saifuddin Kichlu, Vakim Abdul Qadir, Manzor Abdul Wahab, Bahadur Shah Zafar, Hakim Nusrat Hussain, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, Abdul Samad Khan Achakzai, Colonel Shanawaz, Mukhtar Ahmed Ansari, Rafi Ahmed Kidwai, Fakhruddin Ali Ahmed, Ansar Harwani, Tak Sherwani, Nawab Vikarul Mulk, Nawab Mosinal Mulk, Mustafa Hussain, V.M. Ubaidullah, S.R. Rahim, Badruddin Tayabji, Abid Hassan and Mulvi Abdul Hamid. Until 1920, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, later the founder of Pakistan, was a member of the Indian National Congress and was part of the independence struggle. Muhammad Iqbal, poet and philosopher, was a strong proponent of Hindu-Muslim unity in an undivided India, perhaps until 1930. Hussein Shahid Surawardi was also active in the Indian National Congress in Bengal, during his early political career. Muhammad Ali Jawur and Shaqat Ali struggled for the emancipation of the Muslims in the overall Indian context, and struggled for independence alongside Mahatma Gandhi and Abdul Bari of Farangi Mahal. Until the 1930s, the Muslims of India broadly conducted their politics alongside their countrymen, in the overall context of an undivided India. Partition of India The partition of India Hindi, Hindustana ka Badavara Urdu, Tikusam End was the partition of British India on the basis of religious demographics. This led to the creation of the sovereign states of the Dominion of Pakistan that later split into the Islamic Republic of Pakistan and the People's Republic of Bangladesh and the Union of India later Republic of India. 
The Indian Independence Act 1947 had decided 15 August 1947, as the appointed date for the partition. However, Pakistan celebrates its day of creation on 14 August. The partition of India was set forth in the Indian Independence Act 1947 and resulted in the dissolution of the British Indian Empire and the end of the British Raj. It resulted in a struggle between the newly constituted states of India and Pakistan and displaced up to 12.5 million people with estimates of loss of life varying from several hundred thousand to a million most estimates of the numbers of people who crossed the boundaries between India and Pakistan in 1947 range between 10 and 12 million. The violent nature of the partition created an atmosphere of mutual hostility and suspicion between India and Pakistan that plagues their relationship to this day. The partition included the geographical division of the Bengal province into East Bengal, which became part of the Dominion of Pakistan from 1956, East Pakistan. West Bengal became part of India, and a similar partition of the Punjab province became West Punjab later the Pakistani Punjab and Islamabad capital territory and East Punjab later the Indian Punjab, as well as Haryana and Himachal Pradesh. The partition agreement also included the division of Indian government assets, including the Indian Civil Service, the Indian Army, the Royal Indian Navy, the Indian Railways and the Central Treasury, and other administrative services. The two self-governing countries of India and Pakistan legally came into existence at the stroke of midnight on 14–15 August 1947. The ceremonies for the transfer of power were held a day earlier in Karachi, at the time the capital of the new state of Pakistan, so that the last British Viceroy, Lord Mountbatten of Burma, could attend both the ceremony in Karachi and the ceremony in Delhi. Thus, Pakistan's Independence Day is celebrated on 14 August and India's on 15 August. After partition of India in 1947, two-thirds of the Muslims resided in Pakistan both East and West Pakistan but a third resided in India. Based on 1951 census of displaced persons, 7,226,000 Muslims went to Pakistan both West and East from India while 7,249,000 Hindus and Sikhs moved to India from Pakistan both West and East. Some critics allege that British haste in the partition process increased the violence that followed. Because independence was declared prior to the actual partition, it was up to the new governments of India and Pakistan to keep public order. No large population movements were contemplated, the plan called for safeguards for minorities on both sides of the new border. It was a task at which both states failed. There was a complete breakdown of law and order, many died in riots, massacre, or just from the hardships of their flight to safety. What ensued was one of the largest population movements in recorded history. According to Richard Simmons, at the lowest estimate, half a million people perished and 12 million became homeless, however, many argue that the British were forced to expedite the partition by events on the ground. Once in office, Mountbatten quickly became aware if Britain were to avoid involvement in a civil war, which seemed increasingly likely, there was no alternative to partition and a hasty exit from India. Law and order had broken down many times before partition with much bloodshed on both sides. A massive civil war was looming by the time Mountbatten became viceroy. After the Second World War, Britain had limited resources, perhaps insufficient to the task of keeping order. Another viewpoint is that while Mountbatten may have been too hasty he had no real options left and achieved the best he could under difficult circumstances. The historian Lawrence James concurs that in 1947 Mountbatten was left with no option but to cut and run. The alternative seemed to be involvement in a potentially bloody civil war from which it would be difficult to get out. Population. India's Muslim population is the world's third largest and the world's largest Muslim minority population. Officially, India has the third largest Muslim population next to Indonesia and Pakistan. India is home to 10% of the world's Muslim population. India has around 172 million Muslims 2011 census. Pakistan has more Muslims than India, as the 2017 census in Pakistan released on August 25, 2017 put its population at 207.8 million. 
Pakistan's population is 212,742,631 after including data from Gilgit Baltistan and Azad Kashmir, which were added in the final report which will come in 2018. Muslim populations top five countries as of 2017. Muslims represent a majority of the local population in Lakshadweep and Jammu and Kashmir. The largest concentration, about 47% of all Muslims in India, live in the three states of Uttar Pradesh, West Bengal, and Bihar. High concentrations of Muslims are found in states of Assam, Kerala, Maharashtra, Jharkhand, Karnataka, and Telangana. <laughs> Muslim population by states As of 2015, Muslims comprise the majority of the population in the only Indian state of Jammu and Kashmir and in a union territory Lakshadweep. In 110 minority concentrated districts, at least a fifth of the population are Muslim. Muslim populations by Indian state, 2011 census. The census 2011 results of Mao Maram, Payomata, and Pural subdivisions of Senapati district of Manipur were withheld due to administrative reasons. The figures have now been finalized. Topic: <inaudible> Population growth rate. Muslim population growth per census. 1981 census. Asterisk parts of Assam were not included in the 1981 census data due to violence in some districts. 1991 Census, asterisk asterisk Jammu and Kashmir was not included in the 1991 census data due to militant activity in the state. Muslims in India have a much higher total fertility rate TFR compared to that of other religious communities in the country. Because of higher birthrates the percentage of Muslims in India has risen from about 10% in 1951 to 14.23% by 2013. The Muslim population growth rate from 1991 to 01 was higher by more than 10% of the total growth compared to that of Hindus. However, since 1991, the largest decline in fertility rates among all religious groups in India has occurred among Muslims. The population growth rate is also attributable to the fact that majority of Muslim populations are concentrated in the states that are lagging behind in social reforms and services which have shown higher birth rates than other states. However, the Satcher Committee report shows that the Muslim population growth has slowed down and will be on par with national averages. The Satcher Committee report estimated that the Muslim proportion will stabilize at between 17% and 21% of the Indian population by 2100. Social and economic reasons behind population growth. Demographers have put forward several factors behind high birth rates among Muslims in India. According to sociologists Roger and Patricia Jeffery, socioeconomic conditions rather than religious determinism is the main reason for higher Muslim birthrates. Indian Muslims are poorer and less educated compared to their Hindu counterparts. Noted Indian sociologist, B.K. Prasad, argues that since India's Muslim population is more urban compared to their Hindu counterparts, infant mortality rates among Muslims is about 12% lower than those among Hindus. However, other sociologists point out that religious factors can explain high Muslim birthrates. Surveys indicate that Muslims in India have been relatively less willing to adopt family planning measures and that Muslim women have a larger fertility period since they get married at a much younger age compared to Hindu women. On the other hand, it is also documented that Muslims tend to adopt family planning measures. A study conducted by K. C. Zachariah in Kerala in 1983 revealed that on average, the number of children born to a Muslim woman was 4.1 while a Hindu woman gave birth to only 2.9 children. Religious customs and marriage practices were cited as some of the reasons behind the high Muslim birth rate. According to Paul Kurtz, Muslims in India are much more resistant to modern contraception than are Hindus and, as a consequence, the decline in fertility rate among Hindu women is much higher compared to that of Muslim women. The National Family and Health Survey conducted in 1998-99 highlighted that Indian Muslim couples consider a substantially higher number of children to be ideal for a family as compared to Hindu couples in India. The same survey also pointed out that percentage of couples actively using family planning measures was more than 49% among Hindus against 37% among Muslims. Topic: 
Denominations There are many denominations amongst Indian Muslims, the majority belong to the Sunni branch of Islam, while a substantial minority belong to the Shia branch. There are also small minorities of Ahmadiyya and Quranists. Many Indian Muslim communities, both Sunni and Shia, are also considered to be Sufis. Sunni Indian Sunnis largely follow the Hanafi school of Islamic law. The majority of Indian Sunnis follow the Barelvi movement which was founded in 1904 by Ahmed Razi Khan of Bareilly in defense of traditional Islam as understood and practiced in South Asia and in reaction to the reformist attempts of the Diobandi movement. In the 19th century the Diobandi, a revivalist movement in Sunni Islam was established in India. It is named after Dioband a small town northeast of Delhi, where the original madrasa or seminary of the movement was founded. From its early days this movement has been influenced by Wahhabism. A minority of Indian Muslims also follow the Al-I Hadith movement. <laughs> Shia Shia Muslims are a large minority among India's Muslims. However, there has been no particular census conducted in India regarding sex, but Indian sources like Times of India and Daily News and Analysis reported Indian Shia population in mid-2005-2006 between 25% and 31% of entire Muslim population of India which accounts them in numbers between 40 million to 50 million of 157 million Indian Muslim population. However, as per an estimation of one reputed Shia NGO Alaman Trust, India's Shia population in early 2000 was around 30 million with Sayyids comprising just a tenth of the Shia population. According to some national and international sources Indian Shia population is the world's second largest after Iran. <laughs> Bora Bora Ismaili Shia was established in Gujarat in the second half of the 11th century. This community's belief system originates in Yemen, evolved from the Fatimid were persecuted due to their adherence to Fatimid Shia Islam, leading the shift of Dawoodi Bora to India. After occultation of their 21st Fatimid Imam Tayyib, they follow Dai as representative of Imam which are continued till date. Dai Zob appointed Maulai Yaqub after the death of Maulai Abdullah, who was the second Wali al-Hind of the Fatimid Dawat. Mulai Yaqub was the first person of Indian origin to receive this honor under the Dai. He was the son of Mulai Barmal, minister of Hindu Salanki King Jayasimha Sadaraha Anhalwara, Patan. With minister Mulai Tarmal, they had honored the Fatimid Dawat along with their fellow citizens on the call of Mulai Abdullah. Sayyedi Fakhruddin, son of Mulai Tarmal, was sent to western Rajasthan, India, and Mulai Nuruddin went to the Deccan death, Jumadi al-Ula 11 at Don Gam, Aurangabad, Maharashtra, India. One Dai succeeded another until the 23rd Dai in Yemen. In India also Wali ul Hind were appointed by them one after another until Wali ul Hind Mulai Qasim Khan bin Hassan 11th and last Wali ul Hind, D.950 A, Ahmedabad. Due to persecution by the local Zaydi Shia ruler in Yemen, the 24th Dai, Yusuf Najmuddin ibn Sulayman D. CE, moved the whole administration of the Dawat mission to India. The 25th Dai Jalal Shamshuddin D. CE, was first Dai to die in India. His mausoleum is in Ahmedabad, India. The Dawat subsequently moved from Ahmedabad to Jamnagar Manvi, Burhanpur, Surat, and finally to Mumbai and continues there to the present day, currently headed by 53rd Dai. Asaf Ali Ashgar Faizi was a Bora and 20th century Islamic scholar from India who promoted modernization and liberalization of Islam through his writings. He argued that with changing time, modern reforms in Islam are necessary without compromising on basic spirit of Islam. Kojas The Kojas are a group of diverse people who converted to Islam in South Asia. In India, most Kojas live in the states of Gujarat, Maharashtra, Rajasthan and the city of Hyderabad. Many Kojas have also migrated and settled over the centuries in East Africa, Europe and North America. 
The Koja were by then adherents of Nizari Ismailism branch of Shi'ism. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, particularly in the aftermath of the Aga Khan case a significant minority separated and adopted Twelver Shi'ism or Sunni Islam, while the majority remained Nizari Ismaili. Sufis Sufis Islamic mystics played an important role in the spread of Islam in India. They were very successful in spreading Islam, as many aspects of Sufi belief systems and practices had their parallels in Indian philosophical literature, in particular nonviolence and monism. The Sufis orthodox approach towards Islam made it easier for Hindus to practice. Hazrat Khawaja Mu'in Ud Din Chishti, Qutbuddin Bakhtiar Khaki, Nizamuddin Aliya, Shah Jalal, Amir Khusro, Aladdin Sabir Kaliyari, Sheikh Allah ul Haq Pandwi, Ashraf Jahangir Semnani, Waris Ali Shah, Ada Hussain Fani Chishti trained Sufis for the propagation of Islam in different parts of India. Once the Islamic empire was established in India, Sufis invariably provided a touch of colour and beauty to what might have otherwise been rather cold and stark rains. The Sufi movement also attracted followers from the artisan and untouchable communities, they played a crucial role in bridging the distance between Islam and the indigenous traditions. Ahmad Sir Hindi, a prominent member of the Naqshbandi Sufi advocated the peaceful conversion of Hindus to Islam. Ahmadiyya <laughs> <laughs> The Ahmadiyya movement was founded in 1889 by Mirza Ghulam Ahmad of Qadiyan. He claimed to be the promised Messiah and Mahdi awaited by the Muslims and obtained a considerable number of followers initially within the United Provinces, the Punjab and Sindh. Ahmadis claim the Ahmadiyya movement to embody the latter-day revival of Islam and the movement has also been seen to have emerged as an Islamic religious response to the Christian and Arya Samaj missionary activity that was widespread in 19th century India. After the death of Ghulam Ahmad, his successors directed the Ahmadiyya community from Qadiyan which remained the headquarters of the community until 1947 with the creation of Pakistan. The movement has grown in organizational strength and in its own missionary program and has expanded to over 200 countries as of 2014 but has received a largely negative response from mainstream Muslims who see it as heretical, due mainly to Ghulam Ahmad's claim to be a prophet within Islam. Ahmadiyya have been identified as sects of Islam in 2011 Census of India apart from Sunnis, Shias, Boras, and Aghakanis. India has a significant Ahmadiyya population. Most of them live in Rajasthan, Odisha, Haryana, Bihar, Delhi, Uttar Pradesh, and a few in Punjab in the area of Qadian. In India, Ahmadis are considered to be Muslims by the government of India unlike in neighbouring Pakistan. This recognition is supported by a court verdict Shahabuddin Koya v. Ahamd Koya, AIR. 1971 Kur 206. There is no legislation that declares Ahmadis non-Muslims or limits their activities, but they are not allowed to sit on the All India Muslim Personal Law Board, a body of religious leaders India's government recognizes as representative of Indian Muslims. Ahmadiyya are estimated to be from 60,000 to 1 million in India. Quranists <laughs> Non-sectarian Muslims who reject the authority of hadith, known as Quranists, Quranayun, or Al-Quran, are also present in India. In South Asia during the 19th century, the Al-Quran movement formed partially in reaction to the Al-Hadith movement whom they considered to be placing too much emphasis on hadith. Notable Indian Quranists include Chara Ali, Aslam Jairajpuri, Khwaja Ahmad Ud Din Amritsari, and Abdullah Chakralawi. Origins The vast majority of the Muslims in India belong to South Asian ethnic groups. However, some Indian Muslims were found with detectable, traceable, minor to some levels of gene flow from outside, primarily from the Middle East and Central Asia. However, they are found in very low levels. Sources indicate that the castes among Muslims developed as the result of the concept of kafa'a. Those who are referred to as Ashrafs see also Sharif are presumed to have a superior status derived from their foreign Arab ancestry, while the Ajlafs are assumed to be converts from Hinduism, and have a lower status. Many of these ulema also believed that it is best to marry within one own caste. 
The practice of endogamous marriage in one's caste is strictly observed in India. In two of the three genetic studies referenced here, in which is described that samples were taken from several regions of India's Muslim communities, it was again found that the Muslim population was overwhelmingly similar to the local non-Muslims associated, with some having minor but still detectable levels of gene flow from outside, primarily from Iran and Central Asia, rather than directly from the Arabian Peninsula. A research regarding the comparison of Y chromosomes of Indian Muslims with other Indian groups was published in 2005. In this study 124 Sunnis and 154 Shias of Uttar Pradesh were randomly selected for their genetic evaluation. Other than Muslims, Hindu higher and middle caste group members were also selected for the genetic analysis. Out of 1021 samples in this study, only 17 samples showed E haplogroup and all of them were Shias. The very minor increased frequency however, does place these Shias, solely with regards to their haplogroups, closer to Iraqis, Turks and Palestinians. <laughs> Caste system among South Asian Muslims Caste system among South Asian Muslims refers to units of social stratification that have developed among Muslims in South Asia. Topic. Stratification In some parts of South Asia, the Muslims are divided as Ashrafs and Ajlafs. Ashrafs claim a superior status derived from their foreign ancestry. They, in turn, are divided into a number of occupational castes. Barani was specific in his recommendation that the sons of Muhammad, i.e., Ashrafs, be given a higher social status than the low born, i.e., Ilaf. His most significant contribution in the fatwa was his analysis of the castes with respect to Islam. His assertion was that castes would be mandated through state laws or zawabi and would carry precedence over sharia law whenever they were in conflict. Every act which is contaminated with meanness and based on ignominity comes elegantly from the ilaf. He sought appropriate religious sanction to that effect. Barani also developed an elaborate system of promotion and demotion of imperial officers. Wazirs. That was primarily on the basis of their caste. In addition to the Ashraf Ilaf divide, there is also the Arzal caste among Muslims, who were regarded by anti caste activists like Babasaheb Ambedkar as the equivalent of untouchables. The term Arzal stands for degraded. And the Arzal castes are further subdivided into Banar, Halalkor, Hijra, Kasbi, Lalbegi, Mauta, Metar, etc. They are relegated to menial professions such as scavenging and carrying night soil. Some South Asian Muslims have been known to stratify their society according to Qams. Studies of Bengali Muslims in India indicate that the concepts of purity and impurity exist among them and are applicable in inter-group relationships, as the notions of hygiene and cleanliness in a person are related to the person's social position and not to his, her economic status. Muslim Rajput is another caste distinction among Indian Muslims. Some of the upper and middle caste Muslim communities include Syed, Sheikh, Sheikhzada, Kanzada, Patan, Mughal, and Malik. Genetic data has also supported this stratification. In three genetic studies representing the whole of South Asian Muslims, it was found that the Muslim population was overwhelmingly similar to the local non-Muslims associated with minor but still detectable levels of gene flow from outside, primarily from Iran and Central Asia, rather than directly from the Arabian Peninsula. The Satcher Committee's report commissioned by the Government of India and released in 2006, documents the continued stratification in Muslim society. Topic. Interaction and mobility Upon contact with a low-caste Muslim, a Muslim of a higher zat can «purify» by taking a short bath, since there are no elaborate rituals for purification. In Bihar state of India, cases have been reported in which the higher caste Muslims have opposed the burials of lower caste Muslims in the same graveyard. Some data indicates that the castes among Muslims have never been as rigid as that among Hindus. An old saying also goes in Bangladesh, Last year I was a Julaha weaver, this year a sheikh, and next year if the harvest be good, I shall be a Sayyid. 
However, other scholars, such as Ambedkar, disagreed with this thesis. Muhammad Ashraf writes in his Hindustani Mashra Ahde Usta Main that many medieval Islamic rulers did not allow to low class people to enter their courts, or if some did, they forbade them from opening their mouths because they considered them to be impure. Criticism Some Muslim scholars have tried to reconcile and resolve the "...disjunction between Quranic egalitarianism and Indian Muslim social practice," through theorizing it in different ways and interpreting the Quran and Sharia to justify casteism, while some scholars theorize that Muslim castes are not as acute in their discrimination as that among Hindus, Dr. Babasaheb Ambedkar argued otherwise, arguing the social evils in Muslim society were worse than those seen in Hindu society. He was critical of Ashraf antipathy towards the Ilaf and Arzal and attempts to palliate sectarian divisions. He condemned the Indian Muslim community of being unable to reform like Muslims in other countries such as Turkey did during the early decades of the 20th century. <laughs> Prominent Muslims in India India is home to many eminent Muslims who have made their mark in numerous fields and have played a constructive role in India's economic rise and cultural influence across the world. Out of the twelve presidents of the Republic of India, three were Muslims, Zakir Hussain, Fakhruddin Ali Ahmed and APJ Abdul Kalam. Additionally, Muhammad Hidayatullah, Aziz Mushabur Ahmadi, Mirza Hamidullah Beg and Al-Tamaz Kabir held the office of the Chief Justice of India on various occasions since independence. Muhammad Hidayatullah also served as the acting president of India on two separate occasions, and holds the distinct honour of being the only person to have served in all three offices of the President of India, the Vice President of India, and the Chief Justice of India. The former Vice President of India, Muhammad Hamid Ansari, former Foreign Minister Salman Horsheed are Muslims. Dr. S. Y. Qureshi served as the Chief Election Commissioner of India from 30 July 2010 to 10 June 2012. He was the first Muslim to serve in this position. Syed Nassim Ahmad Zaidi was also the chief election commissioner recently. Prominent Indian bureaucrats and diplomats include Abid Hussain, Ali Yavar Young and Asaf Ali. Zafar Saifullah was cabinet secretary of the Government of India from 1993 to 1994. Salman Haidar was Indian Foreign Secretary from 1995 to 1997 and Deputy Permanent Representative of India to the United Nations. Influential Muslim politicians in India include Sheikh Abdullah, Farooq Abdullah and his son Omar Abdullah, Mufti Muhammad Sayyid, Sikandar Bakht, A. R. Antule, Ahmed Patel, C. H. Muhammad Koya, A. B. A. Ghani Khan Choudhury, Mukhtar Abbas Naqvi, Salman Horsheed, Saifuddin Soz, E. Ahmed, Ghulam Nabi Azad, Syed Shanawas Hussain and Asaduddin Awaisi. Numerous Muslims have achieved high rank in the Indian Police Service, with several attaining the rank of Director General of Police and serving as commanders of both state and central armed police forces. In 2013, IPS officer Syed Asif Ibrahim became the first Muslim Director of the Intelligence Bureau, the seniormost appointment in the service. There have been seven Muslim Chief Ministers of Indian states other than Jammu and Kashmir. Barkatullah Khan, Rajasthan, 1971–73 Abdul Ghaffour, Bihar, 1973–75 C.H. Muhammad Koya, Kerala, 1979 Anwar Atamer, Assam, 1980–81 A.R. Antule, Maharashtra, 1980–82 Muhammad Alamuddin, Manipur, 1973–74 Abdul Ghaffour, Bihar, 1973–75 Moh Farooq was a three-time CM of the Union Territory of Pondicherry, some of the most popular and influential as well as critically acclaimed actors and actresses of the Indian film industry are Muslims. These include Yusuf Khan, stage name Dilip Kumar, Shah Rukh Khan, Amir Khan, Salman Khan, Saif Ali Khan, Madhubala, Nawazuddin Siddiqui, Nasiruddin Shah, Johnny Walker, Shabana Azmi, Wahida Rahman, Amjad Khan, Parveen Babi, Faraz Khan, Meena Kumari, Prem Nazir, Mahmoodi, Nargis, Irfan Khan, Farida Jalal, Arshad Warsi, Mahmood, Zinat Aman, Farooq Sheikh and Tabu. 
Some of the best known film directors of Indian cinema include Mehboob Khan, Khwaja Ahmad Abbas, Kamal Amrohi, K. S. Seif, and the Abbas Mustan duo. Indian Muslims also play pivotal roles in other forms of performing arts in India, particularly in music, modern art, and theatre. M. F. Hussain is one of India's best known contemporary artists. Academy Awards winners Rezal Pukati and A. R. Rahman, Naushad, Salim Suleiman and Nadim Akhtar of the Nadim Shravan duo are some of India's celebrated musicians. Abrar Alvi penned many of the greatest classics of Indian cinema. Prominent poets and lyricists include Shakil Badayuni, Sahir Ludhianvi and Majru Sultanpuri. Popular Indian singers of Muslim faith include Muhammad Rafi, Anu Malik, Lucky Ali, Talat Mahmood and Shamshid Begum. Another famous personality is the tabla maestro Zakir Hushan. Sonia Mirza, from Hyderabad, is the highest ranked Indian woman tennis player. In cricket, the most popular sport of India, there are many Muslim players who have made strong and significant impacts. Iftikhar Ali Khan Patauda, Mansoor Ali Khan Patauda, and Muhammad Azharuddin captained the Indian cricket team on various occasions. Other prominent Muslim cricketers in India are Mushtaq Ali, Syed Kermani, Arshad Ayub, Muhammad Kaif, Munaf Patel, Zaheer Khan, Irfan Patan, Yusuf Patan and Wasim Jafar. India is home to several influential Muslim businessmen. Some of India's most prominent firms, such as Wipro, Wakhart, Himalaya Health Care, Hamdard Laboratories, Sipla and Mirza Tanners were founded by Muslims. The only two South Asian Muslim billionaires named by Forbes magazine, Yusuf Hamid and Azim Premji, are from India. Though Muslims are underrepresented in the Indian armed forces, as compared to Hindus and Sikhs, several Indian military Muslim personnel have earned gallantry awards and high ranks for exceptional service to the nation. Air Chief Marshal I. H. Latif was Deputy Chief of the Air Staff India during the Indo-Pakistani War of 1971 and later served as Chief of the Air Staff of the Indian Air Force from 1973 to 1976. Air Marshal Jafar Zahir commanded IAF Agra and was decorated for his service during the 1971 Indo-Pakistan War, eventually rising to the rank of Air Marshal and ending his career as Director General of Civil Aviation from 1979-1980. Indian Army's Abdul Hamid was posthumously awarded India's highest military decoration, the Param Veer Chakra, for knocking out seven Pakistani tanks with a recoilless gun during the Battle of Asal Uttar in 1965. Two other Muslims, Brigadier Muhammad Usman and Muhammad Ismail, were awarded Maha Veer Chakra for their actions during the Indo-Pakistani War of 1947. High-ranking Muslims in the Indian Armed Forces include, Lieutenant General Jamil Mahmood former GOC in Sea Eastern Command of the Indian Army, Lieutenant General Sami Khan former GOC in Sea, Central Army Command, Lieutenant General Syed Atta Hasnain, Lieutenant General Patiaramal Muhammad Hariz GOC in Sea, Southern Command, Major General Afsar Karim, Major General S. M. Hasnain, and Major General Muhammad Amin Naik, Abdul Kalam, one of India's most respected scientists and the father of the Integrated Guided Missile Development Program IGMDP of India, was honoured through his appointment as the 11th President of India. His extensive contribution to India's defence industry lead him to being nicknamed as the Missile Man of India and during his tenure as the President of India, he was affectionately known as People's President. Syed Zahor Qasim, former director of the National Institute of Oceanography, led India's first scientific expedition to Antarctica and played a crucial role in the establishment of Dakshin Gangotri. He was also the former vice-chancellor of Jamia Millia Islamia, secretary of the Department of Ocean Development and the founder of Polar Research in India. Other prominent Muslim scientists and engineers include C. M. Habibullah, a stem cell scientist and director of Deccan College of Medical Sciences and Center for Liver Research and Diagnostics, Hyderabad. In the field of Unani medicine, one can name Hakim Ajmal Khan, Hakim Abdul Hamid and Hakim Syed Zilla Rahman. Salim Ali, was an Indian ornithologist and naturalist, also known as the Birdman of India. Al-Sunnat Sufi leader Hazrat Syed Muhammad Amin Mian Khodri and Abubakar Ahmad Muslayar have been included in the list of most influential Muslims list by Georgetown University. Mahmud Madani, leader of Jamiat Alema e Hind and MP was ranked at 36 for initiating a movement against terrorism in South Asia. Syed Amin Mian has been ranked 44th in the list. 
In January 2018, Jamitha reportedly became the first woman to lead a Jumu'a prayer service in India. Islamic culture in India Indo-Islamic art and architecture Architecture of India took new shape with the advent of Islamic rule in India towards the end of the 12th century CE. New elements were introduced into the Indian architecture that include, use of shapes instead of natural forms, inscriptional art using decorative lettering or calligraphy, inlay decoration and use of coloured marble, painted plaster and brightly coloured glazed tiles. Qawat ul Islam Mosque built in 1193 CE was the first mosque to be built in the Indian subcontinent, its adjoining Tower of Victory. The Qutb Minar also started around 1192 CE, which marked the victory of Muhammad of Ghor and his general Qutb al Din Abak, from Ghazni, Afghanistan, over local Rajput kings, is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site in Delhi. In contrast to the indigenous Indian architecture which was of the trabeate order, i.e. all spaces were spanned by means of horizontal beams, the Islamic architecture was arkuit, i.e. an arch or dome was adopted as a method of bridging a space. The concept of arch or dome was not invented by the Muslims but was, in fact, borrowed and further perfected by them from the architectural styles of the post-Roman period. Muslims used a cementing agent in the form of mortar for the first time in the construction of buildings in India. They further put to use certain scientific and mechanical formulae, which were derived by experience of other civilizations, in their constructions in India. Such use of scientific principles helped not only in obtaining greater strength and stability of the construction materials but also provided greater flexibility to the architects and builders. One fact that must be stressed here is that, the Islamic elements of architecture had already passed through different experimental phases in other countries like Egypt, Iran and Iraq before these were introduced in India. Unlike most Islamic monuments in these countries, which were largely constructed in brick, plaster and rubble, the Indo-Islamic monuments were typical mortar masonry works formed of dressed stones. It must be emphasized that the development of the Indo-Islamic architecture was greatly facilitated by the knowledge and skill possessed by the Indian craftsmen, who had mastered the art of stonework for centuries and used their experience while constructing Islamic monuments in India. Islamic architecture in India can be divided into two parts, religious and secular. Mosques and tombs represent the religious architecture, while palaces and forts are examples of secular Islamic architecture. Forts were essentially functional, complete with a little township within and various fortifications to engage and repel the enemy. Mosques There are more than 300,000 active mosques in India, which is higher than any other country, including the Muslim world. The mosque or masjid is a representation of Muslim art in its simplest form. The mosque is basically an open courtyard surrounded by a pillared veranda, crowned off with a dome. A mirab indicates the direction of the qibla for prayer. Towards the right of the mirab stands the minbar or pulpit from where the imam presides over the proceedings. An elevated platform, usually a minaret from where the faithful are summoned to attend prayers is an invariable part of a mosque. Large mosques where the faithful assemble for the Friday prayers are called the jama masjids. Topic. Tombs and mausoleum The tomb or makbara could range from being a simple affair Aurangzeb's grave to an awesome structure enveloped in grandeur Taj Mahal. The tomb usually consists of a solitary compartment or tomb chamber known as the Husra in whose center is the cenotaph or zara. This entire structure is covered with an elaborate dome. In the underground chamber lies the mortuary or the makbara, in which the corpse is buried in a grave or qabr. Smaller tombs may have a mirab, although larger mausoleums have a separate mosque located at a distance from the main tomb. Normally the whole tomb complex or rauza is surrounded by an enclosure. The tomb of a Muslim saint is called a darga. Almost all Islamic monuments were subjected to free use of verses from the Quran and a great amount of time was spent in carving out minute details on walls, ceilings, pillars and domes. Topic: 
Styles of Islamic Architecture in India Islamic architecture in India can be classified into three sections, Delhi or the imperial style 1191 CE, the provincial style, encompassing the surrounding areas like Ahmedabad, Jaunpur and the Deccan, and the Mughal architecture style 1526 CE. <laughs> Law and politics Certain civil matters of jurisdiction for Muslims such as marriage, inheritance and waqf properties are governed by the Muslim personal law, which was developed during British rule and subsequently became part of independent India with some amendments. Indian Muslim personal law is not developed as a sharia law but as an interpretation of existing Muslim laws as part of common law. The Supreme Court of India has ruled that Sharia or Muslim law holds precedence for Muslims over Indian civil law in such matters. Muslims in India are governed by the Muslim Personal Law Shariat Application Act, 1937. It directs the application of Muslim personal law to Muslims in marriage, mar dower, divorce, maintenance, gifts, waqf, wills, and inheritance. The courts generally apply the Hanafi Sunni law for Sunnis. Shia Muslims are independent of Sunni law for those areas where Shia law differs substantially from Sunni practice. The Indian constitution provides equal rights to all citizens irrespective of their religion. Article 44 of the constitution recommends a uniform civil code. However, attempts by successive political leadership in the country to integrate Indian society under common civil code is strongly resisted and is viewed by Indian Muslims as an attempt to dilute the cultural identity of the minority groups of the country. The All India Muslim Personal Law Board was established for the protection and continued applicability of Muslim Personal Law, i.e. Shariat Application Act in India. The Satcher Committee was asked to report about the condition of Muslims in India in 2005. Almost all the recommendations of the Satcher Committee have been implemented. The following laws, acts of Indian legislation are applicable to Muslims in India except in the state of Goa regarding matters of marriage, succession, inheritance, child adoption etc. Muslim Personal Law Sharia Application Act, 1937 The Dissolution of Muslim Marriages Act, 1939 Muslim Women Protection of Rights on Divorce Act, 1986 Note, above laws are not applicable in the state of Goa. The Goa Civil Code, also called the Goa Family Law, is the set of civil laws that governs the residents of the Indian state of Goa. In India, as a whole, there are religion-specific civil codes that separately govern adherents of different religions. Goa is an exception to that rule, in that a single secular code, law governs all Goans, irrespective of religion, ethnicity or linguistic affiliation. Above laws are also not applicable to Muslims throughout India who had civil marriage under the Special Marriage Act, 1954. Bharatiya Muslim Mahila Andolan is an Indian Muslim women's organization in India. It released a draft on June 23, 2014, Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act recommending that polygamy be made illegal in Muslim Personal Law of India. The Citizenship Amendment Bill, 2016 was proposed for the changes in the citizenship and immigration norms of the country by relaxing the requirements for Indian citizenship. The applicability of the amendments are debated in news as it is on religious lines excluding Muslims. India's constitution and parliament have protected the rights of Muslims but, under the Bharatiya Janata Party, Modi ministry, there has been a growth in climate of fear and targeting of dissenters, affecting the feelings of security and tolerance amongst Indian Muslims. <laughs> Active Muslim political parties All India Majlis e Itihadul Muslimin AIMIM, led by Asaduddin Awaisi active in states of Telangana, Maharashtra and Karnataka. Indian Union Muslim League IUMN, led by E. Ahmed active in Kerala. All India United Democratic Front AIUDF, led by Badruddin Ajmal active in Assam state. <laughs> active Muslim majority political parties National Conference NC main party of Jammu and Kashmir state People's Democratic Party PDP main party of Jammu and Kashmir state <laughs> 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 
Topic: <laughs> Conversion controversy. Considerable controversy exists both in scholarly and public opinion about the conversions to Islam typically represented by the following schools of thought. The bulk of Muslims are descendants of migrants from the Iranian plateau or Arabs. Conversions occurred for non-religious reasons of pragmatism and patronage such as social mobility among the Muslim ruling elite or for relief from taxes. Conversion was a result of the actions of Sunni Sufi saints and involved a genuine change of heart. Conversion came from Buddhists and the en masse conversions of lower castes for social liberation and as a rejection of the oppressive Hindu caste strictures. A combination, initially made under duress followed by a genuine change of heart. As a socio-cultural process of diffusion and integration over an extended period of time into the sphere of the dominant Muslim civilization and global polity at large, embedded within this lies the concept of Islam as a foreign imposition and Hinduism being a natural condition of the natives who resisted, resulting in the failure of the project to Islamize the Indian subcontinent and is highly embroiled within the politics of the partition and communalism in India. An estimate of the number of people killed, based on the Muslim chronicles and demographic calculations, was done by K. S. Lal in his book Growth of Muslim Population in Medieval India, who claimed that between 1000 CE and 1500 CE, the population of Hindus decreased by 80 million. His work has come under criticism by historians such as Simon Digby SOAS, University of London, and Irfan Habib for its agenda and lack of accurate data in pre-census times. Lal has responded to these criticisms in later works. Historians such as Will Durant contend that Islam was spread through violence. Jadunath Sarkar contends that several Muslim invaders were waging a systematic jihad against Hindus in India to the effect that, "...every device short of massacre in cold blood was resorted to in order to convert heathen subjects." Hindus who converted to Islam were not immune to persecution due to the Muslim caste system in India established by Ziauddin al Burana in the Fatawa i Jahandari, where they were regarded as an Ilif caste and subjected to discrimination by the Ashraf castes. Disputers of the conversion by the sword theory point to the presence of the large Muslim communities found in southern India, Sri Lanka, western Burma, Bangladesh, southern Thailand, Indonesia and Malaysia coupled with the distinctive lack of equivalent Muslim communities around the heartland of historical Muslim empires in the Indian subcontinent as refutation to the "...conversion by the sword theory". The legacy of the Muslim conquest of South Asia is a hotly debated issue and argued even today. Different population estimates by economics historian Angus Madison and by Jean Noel Byraben also indicate that India's population did not decrease between 1000 and 1500, but increased by about 35 million during that time. Not all Muslim invaders were simply raiders. Later rulers fought on to win kingdoms and stayed to create new ruling dynasties. The practices of these new rulers and their subsequent heirs, some of whom were born of Hindu wives, varied considerably. While some were uniformly hated, others developed a popular following. According to the memoirs of Ibn Battuta who travelled through Delhi in the 14th century, one of the previous sultans had been especially brutal and was deeply hated by Delhi's population. Battuta's memoirs also indicate that Muslims from the Arab world, Persia and Anatolia were often favoured with important posts at the royal court suggesting that locals may have played a somewhat subordinate role in the Delhi administration. The term, Turk was commonly used to refer to their higher social status. Saa Rizvi the wonder that was India, too, however points to Muhammad bin Tuluk as not only encouraging locals but promoting artisan groups such as cooks, barbers and gardeners to high administrative posts. In his reign, it is likely that conversions to Islam took place as a means of seeking greater social mobility and improved social standing. Intra-Muslim relations Shia-Sunni relations The Sunnis and Shia are the biggest Muslim groups by denomination. Although the two groups remain cordial, there have been instances of conflict between the two groups especially in the city of Lucknow. Topic. Relationship of Muslims with non-Muslim communities <laughs> 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 
Topic: <laughs> Muslim Hindu conflict. Before 1947 the conflict between Hindus and Muslims in the Indian subcontinent has a complex history which can be said to have begun with the Umayyad Caliphate's invasion of Sindh in 711. The persecution of Hindus during the Islamic expansion in India during the medieval period was characterized by destruction of temples, often illustrated by historians by the repeated destruction of the Hindu temple at Somnath and the anti-Hindu practices of the Mughal emperor Aurangzeb. Although there were instances of conflict between the two groups, a number of Hindus worshipped and continue to worship at the tombs of Muslim Sufi saints. From 1947 to 1991 the aftermath of the partition of India in 1947 saw large-scale sectarian strife and bloodshed throughout the nation. Since then, India has witnessed sporadic large-scale violence sparked by underlying tensions between sections of the Hindu and Muslim communities. These include 1969 Gujarat riots, 1970 Biwandi riots, 1983 Nelly massacre, and the 1989 Bagalpur violence. These conflicts stem in part from the ideologies of Hindu nationalism and Islamic extremism. Since independence, India has always maintained a constitutional commitment to secularism. Since 1992 the sense of communal harmony between Hindus and Muslims in the post-partition period was compromised greatly by the raising of the Babri Mosque in Ayodhya. The demolition took place in 1992 and was perpetrated by the Hindu nationalist Bharatiya Janata Party and organizations like Rashtriya Swayamsevak Sangh, Bhairung Dal, Vishva Hindu Parishad and Shiv Sena. This was followed by tit-for-tat violence by Muslim and Hindu fundamentalists throughout the country, giving rise to the Bombay riots and the 1993 Bombay bombings. Kashmir 1990s. During the eruption of militancy in the 1990s, following persecution and threats by radical Islamists and militants, the native Kashmiri Hindus were forced into an exodus from Kashmir, a Muslim-majority region in northern India. Mosques issued warnings, telling them to leave Kashmir, convert to Islam or be killed. Approximately 300,000-350,000 Pandits left the valley during the mid-80s and the 90s, many of them have been living in abject conditions in refugee camps of Jammu, Gujarat 2002. One of the most violent events in recent times took place during the Gujarat riots in 2002, where it is estimated 1,000 people were killed, most allegedly Muslim. Some sources claim there were approximately 2,000 Muslim deaths. There were also allegations made of state involvement. The riots were in retaliation to the Ghadra train burning in which 59 Hindus pilgrims returning from the disputed site of the Babri Masjid, were burnt alive in a train fire at the Ghadra railway station. Gujarat police claimed that the incident was a planned act carried out by extremist Muslims in the region against the Hindu pilgrims. The Banerjee Commission appointed to investigate this finding declared that the fire was an accident. In 2006 the High Court decided the constitution of such a committee was illegal as another inquiry headed by Justice Nanavati Shah was still investigating the matter. In 2004, several Indian school textbooks were scrapped by the National Council of Educational Research and Training after they were found to be loaded with anti-Muslim prejudice. The NCERT argued that the books were written by scholars hand-picked by the previous Hindu nationalist administration." According to The Guardian, the textbooks depicted India's past Muslim rulers, "...as barbarous invaders and the medieval period as a dark age of Islamic colonial rule which snuffed out the glories of the Hindu empire that preceded it." In one textbook, it was purported that the Taj Mahal, the Qutb Minar and the Red Fort, all examples of Islamic architecture were designed and commissioned by Hindus." West Bengal 2010. In the 2010 Daganga riots, rioting began on 6 September 2010, when an Islamist mob resorted to arson and violence on the Hindu neighborhoods of Daganga, Kartikpur and Baliagata under the Daganga police station area. The violence began late in the evening and continued throughout the night into the next morning. The District Police, Rapid Action Force, Central Reserve Police Force and Border Security Force all failed to stop the mob violence and the army was finally deployed. The army staged a flag march on the Taki Road, while Islamist violence continued unabated in the interior villages off the Taki Road, till Wednesday in spite of army presence and promulgation of prohibitory orders under Section 144 of the CRPC. Assam 2012. 
At least 77 people died and 400,000 people were displaced in the 2012 Assam violence between indigenous Bodos and East Bengal rooted Muslims. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Muslim Sikh conflict. Sikhism emerged in the Punjab during the Mughal period. Conflict between early Sikhs and the Muslim power center at Delhi reached an early high point in 1606 when Guru Aryan, the fifth guru of the Sikhs, was tortured and killed by Jahangir, the Mughal emperor. After the death of the fifth beloved guru his son had taken his spot Guru Hargobind who basically made the Sikhs a warrior religion. Guru Ji was the first to defeat the Mughal Empire in a battle which had taken place in present Sri Hargobindpur in Gurdaspur after this point the Sikhs were forced to organize themselves militarily for their protection. Later in the 16th century, Teg Bahadur became Guru in 1665 and led the Sikhs until 1675. Teg Bahadur was executed by the Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb for helping to protect Hindus, after a delegation of Kashmiri Pandits came to him for help when the Emperor condemned them to death for failing to convert to Islam. At this point Aurangzeb had instituted forceful conversions for which they would charge citizens with various accusations granting them to have charges and execution waived off if they converted this led to a high increase of violence between the Sikhs and Hindus as well as rebellions of Aurangzeb's empire. This is an early example which illustrates how the Hindu-Muslim conflict and the Muslim-Sikh conflicts are connected. After which Guru Gobind Singh and the Sikhs helped the next successor of the throne of India to rise who was Bahadur Shah Zafar for certain period of time good relations were maintained somewhat like they were in Akbar's time until disputes arose again. The Mughal period saw various invaders coming into India through Punjab with which they would loot and severely plunder. Better relations have been seen by Dulla Bhatti, Mian Mir, Pir Budu Shah, Pir Bikram Shah, Bulla Shah. In 1699, the Khalsa was founded by Guru Gobind Singh, the last Guru. A former ascetic was charged by Gobind Singh with the duty of punishing those who had persecuted the Sikhs. After the Guru's death, Baba Banda Singh Bahadur became the leader of the Sikh army and was responsible for several attacks on the Mughal Empire. He was executed by the Emperor Jahandar Shah after refusing the offer of a pardon if he converted to Islam. The decline of Mughal power during the 17th and 18th centuries, along with the growing strength of the Sikh Empire resulted in a balance of power which protected the Sikhs from more violence. The Sikh Empire was absorbed into the British Indian Empire after the Second Anglo-Sikh War of 1849. Massive population exchanges took place during the partition of India in 1947, and the British Indian province of Punjab was divided into two parts, and the western parts were given to the Dominion of Pakistan, while the eastern parts were given to the Union of India. 5.3 million Muslims moved from India to West Punjab and Pakistan, 3.4 million Hindus and Sikhs moved from Pakistan to East Punjab and India. The newly formed governments were completely unequipped to deal with migrations of such staggering magnitude, and massive violence and slaughter occurred on both sides of the border. Estimates of the number of deaths range around roughly 500,000, with low estimates at 200,000 and high estimates at 1 million. Tens of thousands of Muslims are living with a disguised identity as Sikhs since the confessional cleansing during the partition of India. Muslim-Christian conflict In spite of the fact that there have been relatively fewer conflicts between Muslims and Christians in India in comparison to those between Muslims and Hindus, or Muslims and Sikhs, the relationship between Muslims and Christians have also been occasionally turbulent. With the advent of European colonialism in India with the demise of Mughal Empire beginning from the 18th century, Christians were persecuted in some Muslim-ruled princely states in India. Anti-Christian persecution by Tipu Sultan in the 17th century Perhaps the most infamous acts of anti-Christian persecution by Muslims was committed by Tipu Sultan, the ruler of the Kingdom of Mysore against the Mangalorean Catholics. Tipu was widely reputed to be anti-Christian. The captivity of Mangalorean Catholics at Srirangapatna, which began on 24 February 1784 and ended on 4 May 1799, remains the most disconsolate memory in their history. Muslim-Buddhist conflict 
In 1989 there was a social boycott by the Buddhists of the Muslims of Leh district. The boycott remained in force till 1992. Relations between the Buddhists and Muslims in Leh improved after the lifting of the boycott, although suspicions remain. Muslim institutes There are several well-established Muslim institutions in India. Here is a list of reputed institutions established by Muslims in India. <laughs> Modern universities and institutes Al-Amin Educational Society Aliyah University Aligarh Muslim University Jamia Markazu Sikafathi Sunniya Madinu Sakwafadhal Islamiya B.S. Abdur Rahman University Darul Huda Islamic University Darul Uloom Dioband Darul Uloom Nadwadal Ulama Ibn Sina Academy of Medieval Medicine and Sciences Integral University Jamal Muhammad College, Tirakirapali Hamdard University, Delhi Jamia Millia Islamia, New Delhi MSS WAKF Board College, Madurai the only college in India run by a state WAKF board Maulana Azad National Urdu University Hyderabad Maulana Azad College of Arts and Science, Aurangabad Muslim Educational Association of Southern India National College of Engineering, Tirunelveli Asmania University, Hyderabad Karim City College, Jamshedpur Traditional Islamic universities Al Jamia Tu Safiya, Bora Al Jamiat al Ashrafiya, Barelvi Jamia Darussalam, Umarabad Al Jam Atul Islamiyah, Uttar Pradesh Darul Huda Islamic University, Kerala Jamia Nizamiya, Hyderabad Manzur e Islam, Bareilly Raza Academy Sunni Cultural Center, Karanthor, Kerala Islamic traditions in South Asia Sufism is a mystical dimension of Islam, often complementary with the legalistic path of the Sharia had a profound impact on the growth of Islam in India. A Sufi attains a direct vision of oneness with God, often on the edges of orthodox behavior, and can thus become a pir living saint who may take on disciples and set up a spiritual lineage that can last for generations. Orders of Sufis became important in India during the 13th century following the ministry of Moinuddin Chishti (1142–1236), who settled in Ajmer and attracted large numbers of converts to Islam because of his holiness. His Chishti order went on to become the most influential Sufi lineage in India, although other orders from Central Asia and Southwest Asia also reached India and played a major role in the spread of Islam. In this way, they created a large literature in regional languages that embedded Islamic culture deeply into older South Asian traditions. <laughs> <laughs> Leadership and organizations The Ajmer Sharif Dargah and Dargah e Allah Hazrat at Bareilly Sharif are prime centre of Sufi oriented Sunni Muslims of India. Indian Shia Muslims form a substantial minority within the Muslim community of India comprising between 25-31% of total Muslim population in an estimation done during mid-2005-2006 of the then Indian Muslim population of 157 million. Sources like the Times of India and DNA reported Indian Shia population during that period between 40 million to 50 million of 157 million Indian Muslim population. The Diobandi movement, another section of the Sunni Muslim population, originate from the Darul Uloom Dioband, an influential religious seminary in the district of Saharanpur of Uttar Pradesh. The Jamiat Alema e Hind, founded by Diobandi scholars in 1919, became a political mouthpiece for the Darul Uloom. The Jamaat e Islami Hind, founded in 1941, advocates the establishment of an Islamic government and has been active in promoting education, social service, and ecumenical outreach to the community. Topic: 
Topic: <laughs> Hajj subsidy. The Government of India subsidizes the cost of the airfare for Hajj pilgrims. All pilgrims travel on Air India. In compliance with Supreme Court of India and Allahabad High Court directions, the Government of India has proposed that, starting from 2011, the amount of government subsidy per person will be decreased and by 2017 will be ended completely. Maulana Mahmud A. Madani, a member of the Rajya Sabha and General Secretary of the Jamiat Alema e Hind, declared that the Hajj subsidy is a technical violation of Islamic Sharia, since the Quran declares that Hajj should be performed by Muslims using their own resources. Influential Muslim lobbies in India have regularly insisted that the Hajj subsidy should be phased out as it is un Islamic. Muslims in government India has seen three Muslim presidents and many chief ministers of state governments have been Muslims. Apart from that, there are and have been many Muslim ministers, both at the centre and at the state level. Out of the twelve presidents of the Republic of India, three were Muslims, Zakir Hussain, Fakhruddin Ali Ahmed and APJ Abdul Kalam. Additionally, Muhammad Hidayatullah, Aziz Mushabur Ahmadi, Mirza Hamidullah Beg and Al Tamas Kabir held the office of the Chief Justice of India on various occasions since independence. Muhammad Hidayatullah also served as the Acting President of India on two separate occasions, and holds the distinct honour of being the only person to have served in all three offices of the President of India, the Vice President of India, and the Chief Justice of India. The former Vice President of India, Muhammad Hamid Ansari, former Foreign Minister Salman Horsheed, and former Director head of the Intelligence Bureau, Syed Asif Ibrahim, are Muslims. Ibrahim was the first Muslim to hold this office. From 30 July 2010 to 10 June 2012, Dr. S. Y. Qureshi served as the Chief Election Commissioner of India. He was the first Muslim to serve in this position. Prominent Indian bureaucrats and diplomats include Abid Hussain, Ali Yavar Young and Asaf Ali. Zafar Saifullah was Cabinet Secretary of the Government of India from 1993 to 1994. Salman Haidar was the Foreign Secretary from 1995 to 1997 and Deputy Permanent Representative of India to the United Nations. Influential Muslim politicians in India include Sheikh Abdullah, Farooq Abdullah and his son Omar Abdullah former Chief Minister of Jammu and Kashmir, Mufti Muhammad Sayyid, Mehabooba Mufti, Sikandar Bakht, A. R. Antule, Ahmed Patel, C. H. Muhammad Koya, A. B. A. Ghani Khan Choudhury, Mukhtar Abbas Naqvi, Salman Horsheed, Saifuddin Soz, E. Ahmed, Ghulam Nabi Azad, Syed Shanawaz Hussain and Asaduddin Awaisi. Ghettoization of Indian Muslims Ghettoization among Indian Muslims began in the mid-1970s when first communal riots occurred. It got heightened after the 1989 Bagalpur violence in Bihar and became a trend after the demolition of the Babri Masjid in 1992. Soon several major cities developed ghettos, or segregated areas, where the Muslim population moved in. This trend however, did not help for the anticipated security the anonymity of ghetto was thought to have provided. During the 2002 Gujarat riots, several such ghettos became easy targets for the rioting mobs, as they enabled the profiling of residential colonies. This kind of ghettoization can be seen in Mumbai, Delhi, Kolkata and many cities of Gujarat where a clear socio-cultural demarcation exists between Hindu-dominated and Muslim-dominated neighborhoods. In places like Gujarat, riots and alienation of Muslims have led to large-scale ghettoization of the community. For example, the Juapura area of Ahmedabad has swelled from 250,000 to 650,000 residents since 2002 riots. Muslims in Gujarat have no option but to head to a ghetto, irrespective of their economic and professional status. Increase in ghetto living has also shown a strengthening of stereotyping due to lack of cross cultural interaction, and reduction in economic and educational opportunities at large. Secularism in India is being seen by some as a favour to the Muslims, and not an imperative for democracy. See also Islam in South Asia Islam in Africa Islam in Europe Islam in Russia 
Islam in Central Asia Islam in China Islam in Southeast Asia Islam in Afghanistan Bihari Muslims Gujarati Muslims Hyderabadi Muslims Tamil Muslim Mapilla Hindu Islamic relations Hinduism in Pakistan Hinduism in Bangladesh Muslim nationalism in South Asia NCERT textbook controversies Mode. Ahmed Khan v. Shah Bano Begum History of Islam Triple Talak in India <laughs>